let's do a bit of trade review. You have an absolute advantage in making a good if you can make it in a lower resource cost than your trading partner can. You have a comparative advantage in making a good if you can make it at a lower opportunity cost than your trading partner can. This video is going to have a bit of a science fiction theme. Let's imagine that super technologically advanced aliens, they come to Earth and they basically ignore us. The aliens care about two things, donuts and flying saucers. Now, the aliens are much better than we are at making donuts. They can make a donut in a second while it takes us a full minute. And they're infinitely better than we are at making flying saucers. We can't do it, and they can make a flying saucer in one minute. Who has a comparative advantage in making which good, and who has an absolute advantage in making which good? Why don't you pause the video and think of the answer before going on? Okay. Well, now, absolute advantage, remember, refers to resource costs, and time is a resource cost. So the aliens have an absolute advantage both in making donuts and flying saucers. But comparative advantage looks at opportunity cost. Now, we, in this simple too-good world, we have no opportunity cost of making a donut. Because, you know, you make a donut, we're not, we couldn't have spent that time building a flying saucer. The aliens do have an opportunity cost of making a donut, because every time they make a donut, they give up 1 60th of a flying saucer. So the theory of trade would basically say, well, humans and aliens can trade. We should each produce what we have a comparative advantage in. So humans should make donuts, and the aliens should make some flying saucers. Why don't you think about how both parties could benefit from trade? Well, here's what could happen. You can imagine, you know, a group of humans go to the aliens and they say, oh, great aliens, we know you're much, much better than we are at everything, but we're going to make you a deal. We will give you a hundred donuts in return for a flying saucer. Now, we give you a hundred donuts, you know, we've saved you a hundred seconds of work. Of those hundred seconds, take 60 of them and make us a flying saucer. You've got 40 seconds left over. So basically aliens, through trading with us, through, through accepting 100 donuts from us in return for a flying saucer, you get 100 donuts and it only costs you 60 seconds, where normally it would cost you a full 100 seconds. So even though you are vastly technologically superior to us at making donuts, we don't deny that you're still saving time trading with us. And for the humans, of course, you know, I mean, God, you get to trade 100 donuts for a flying saucer. That's a pretty darn good deal. So even though the aliens are 60 times better than we are at making donuts and infinitely better than we are at making flying saucers, humans and aliens can still benefit from trade. Well, we can make an analogous argument between, say, the United States and a very poor country. Let's say there are two goods, there are shirts and computers, and the United States is much better at making shirts than this very poor country, 60 times better. We can make a shirt in a minute. In the poor country, it takes a full hour to make a shirt. And let's say that we're infinitely better at making a computer. We can make a computer in an hour, but the poor country can't do it. Still, both countries could benefit from trade, similar to what happened in the last example could imagine the very poor country could go to the United States and said, look, you know, we'll, we'll give you a hundred shirts. Now those hundred shirts that, you know, you, you, lot, you all wear shirts and it would have taken you a hundred minutes to make those hundred shirts. Take 60 of those minutes and make a computer and give it to us. So you get a hundred shirts for one hour when normally you didn't trade, it would have taken you a hundred minutes make a hundred shirts. So you're better off. And we, of course, for a hundred shirts, we get a computer. That's a pretty good deal for us. So even though the United States is significantly technologically advanced in the poor country and can, you know, make one good the other country can't and the good that both countries can make, the U.S. can make much, much better, both countries can still benefit from trade. Let's take a slightly different angle on trade and talk about something called roundabout production. But first, let me continue with my science fiction theme. Let's pretend someone invents a machine that rearranges the molecules in wheat and turns it into a car. So you'd have farmers would, would take their wheat 
and then they would ship it off to where this machine is. The wheat would go into the machine and jing, jing, whatever, and it would go and turn into a car. This would be a truly great, you know, invention. Now, maybe farmers wouldn't use it. Maybe the price of wheat would be so high it wouldn't be worth turning into a car, but maybe it would be. And from the point of view of what's best for an economy, let's say the United, this was the United States doing it, we could, we could make cars the old-fashioned way, you know, by putting steel together or however else they make cars, or we could use this machine. And you can imagine, you know, these, these would compete. Maybe it was cheaper to, to basically grow the car by, you know, growing the raw materials and turning that through this machine into a car, or maybe it would be cheaper to directly make the car. But, you know, overall, if the machine, if people were using the machine, that probably meant it was cheaper to do it that way, and that would be considered a good thing. Someone developing the machine I've described, that would be a great invention. That would help our economy, and, and we'd be happy. Sure, there'd be some auto workers who would lose their jobs, and, you know, we should feel sympathy for them. But, you know, te when technology advances, people who used to do things in old, inefficient ways, they lose their jobs. Hopefully, they find new ones. They don't always, but hopefully they do. But... You know, if you, if you believe in economic growth, you believe in technological progress, you, you've got to accept there's going to be change. There'll be new ways of making things. You know, we, we don't want to preserve the buggy whip industry in a, in a world without, without horses and carriages. Well, the machine I described in the last slide doesn't exist, but something really, really similar does, and you've all heard about it. It's called trade. So a farmer in Iowa grows wheat and he sends it to a port, and then the wheat is sent to Japan, and the Japanese give some yen for the wheat, and then that yen is used to buy a car, and the car is put on the ship, and the ship comes back to the United States, and the farmer in Iowa now has a nice Japanese car in return for his wheat. Does it really matter? I mean, in the, in the last slide, you take wheat, you ship it off somewhere, it's put in a machine, the molecules are rearranged, and it comes out a car. And in this case, you take wheat, you ship it to a ship, it goes off somewhere, and someone says, oh, I'm willing to trade, you know, basically a car for the wheat, and then the car comes back. In both cases, the farmer in Iowa is effectively growing automobiles in his field. Now, maybe it won't be worth it for farmers to trade their wheat for the car, just as maybe it wouldn't be worth it for them to use the machine in the previous slide to turn their wheat into a car, but maybe it would be. And I, I think if you didn't think that the machine in the last slide was inherently evil, you certainly shouldn't object to somebody shipping wheat to another country and then having it come back in car form. Uh, this is... This is um, roundabout production. So you can imagine in the United States, we can directly make cars or we can make things that we send to other countries who make cars and we, we could trade for those things. You know, we should do whatever's cheapest, whatever we have a comparative advantage in. Trade is a huge topic. And in this video, I'm just going to cover some of the additional highlights. So some other benefits of trade. A big one is specialization. And, and Adam Smith discussed this. If you specialize in something, you, you tend to get better at that one thing. You, you wouldn't want your doctor to also be your lawyer and your dentist and your kid's kindergarten teacher because, you know, when would she have the time to be really good at any of them? So the more people specialize generally, the better they get at their narrow tasks. So we're all better off if lots of people specialize. But trade allows there to be a lot more specialization because you're, you're more able to focus on doing something really, really narrow if you have the potential of reaching a lot of, pot of potential um, customers. So thinking about writing a book, you can write a book only on a very narrow topic if there's a lot of people who might be able to buy the book and the more people you can trade with, the more likely that is to come. Or if you make a special part you know, you, you work at a machine shop and you make one part that is, you know, very limited uses. You can really specialize in what you're doing if you, you know, more if you can sell that part potentially to the whole world. So through trade, we have a lot more opportunities to specialize. Um, innovation is another benefit of trade. So imagine you're, you're thinking of some new wonder drug and you're deciding how much should we invest in trying to come up with a new cure for cancer. You're thinking, okay, it might not work, but if it does work, we can sell it to a lot of people to make a lot, to make profit. Well, the more people you can potentially sell a successful cancer treatment to, the more money you'll be willing to invest to develop the drug. Or 
it, it applies to any other innovation. You're thinking of, gee, you know, we spend a billion dollars, we might come up with a more fuel efficient air conditioner. Is it worth it? Well, it will depend on if we do develop a more energy efficient air conditioner, how many people can we sell that to? The more potential people you could sell that to, the more likely you are to put the effort into innovating, to put, to put money into innovation. Another benefit of innovation is that when you trade, you get the benefit of other people's innovation. So if the U.S. trades with Japan and you know the Japanese come up with some better way of making a refrigerator, well, that we can incorporate that in our refrigerators, or we can we can directly buy their innovation. This is why I think a lot of economists think it's great news for the United States that India and China are getting very rich very quickly, because there's a lot of people in India and China who you know will hopefully. As the country gets richer, more of them will go to become scientists and engineers and will directly do innovation. But also as they get richer, they'll be willing to pay more for American innovations. So we'll have greater, you know, the, the more rich people there are in the world, the more technological innovations there'll be and the more economic growth there'll be, the richer we'll be, the more likely we'll come up with a cure for cancer and cure for other bad things and get more good things. Let's talk about two additional benefits of trade. The first is reduced corruption do a sports analogy. Say, you know, you're in a basketball league and, you know, you, you play the games all in the same place with the same refs. But the referees, they're corrupt. They they favor their friends and their friends' teams always tend to win. You all know this and you play basketball. It's kind of fun even though you know the outcome and it really, it really reduces the quality of play. I mean, you don't put that much effort into practice because it's not like the practice is going to matter. It's the people the refs like who are going to win. Now you, you want to play an away game in a place where the refs aren't corrupt, or at least not as corrupt. You, in order to play that away game, you've got to get better. You've got to improve your basketball skills. S similar stuff can happen with trade. Now, there's certainly corruption in the United States where I live, but the economic environment of the United States is actually a lot less corrupt than most poor countries. Probably not all, but, but we are in the United States... Again, we have less corrupt economic corruption than exists in most poor countries. So let's imagine, let's look at a poor country and let's let's consider, say, refrigerator manufacturers. And let's say there's, there's a, a, a dictatorship in a poor country and the dictator says just one company is allowed to make refrigerators. And of course, it's a refrigerator company that pays him the most in terms of bribes or maybe his brother-in-law runs the, the refrigerator company. Now, you know, that refrigerator company is like, well... You know, we're, we're selling refrigerators in this country. We don't have to worry about any competition because the dictator won't let that happen. So our job is really just to please the dictator. We don't really have to worry that much about quality or price because we're playing in a corrupt field where the ref is just letting us win all the time. But now suddenly there's trade. The dictator signs a free trade agreement with the United States and suddenly... American refrigerators are allowed to be sold in this country, and though this country, this you know poor, corrupt country, has the opportunity of selling refrigerators in the United States. Well, now, to survive, this refrigerator company is going to have to start making much higher quality refrigerators, because suddenly customers are not captive to him. They want a refrigerator. They can buy the imported American refrigerators. So that's sort of the stick to get them to do a better job. But the carrot is they could say, oh, wait a minute. So there's like 300 million Americans who buy a whole bunch of refrigerators. If we started making some high quality refrigerators that could compete with the American models, well, we could sell to America and do really, really well. So, you know, that gives them an incentive to suddenly improve quality. And now, you know, not to win the refrigerator contest by being nice to the government or the dictator, but to win by, by pleasing customers. So that's that's a very good thing. That's a huge benefit of trade to corrupt countries. Another benefit to trade, I think, is, is brain gains. And this refers to more trade of people. So let, let's, you know, take someone born in a poor country, born with very strong math abilities, but, you know, and unfortunately, they're, they're in a country where they can't do much with those abilities. They're going to be, a, you know, an agricultural laborer without, you know, just using very simple farm instrument implements. Well, that's a, you know, the, the math talents of this person are, are mostly lost to mankind. We, we, we don't, that's not going to improve our, this person's talents won't, won't be really added to mankind's. But now there's trade in people. And maybe this person 
gets a job in the United States and starts working for a computer programming company? Will the world has gained full access to this brain? Or maybe Microsoft finds out, oh, there's some really smart poor people in this country. Let's open up a branch there and we'll pay five times the salary that these poor people make, or maybe even a hundred times they're getting so little. We'll, we'll take on these great brains that would have been you know, wasted doing simple agricultural labor and now can do programming or, or maybe you know, other companies can do the same. So from the point of view of making sure that you know, our species best utilizes really bright brains, we, we want trade in people. We want people either to be able to move where their brains can be fully utilized or if not that, have companies come in that can make better use of their brains. This is very, very important, again, for smart people who are born in poor countries, for their brains not to go to waste. We need trade. All right, let's talk about a bunch of commonly made objections to trade, some of them which are legitimate and some of which are silly. So the first, trade harms workers in rich countries. So here's how the argument might go. You know, an American worker might say, you know, people in China are mostly pretty poor and I, the Chinese were factory workers. They make like one tenth of what I do. Well, God, I don't want us to trade with China because who's ever going to hire me? I mean, if you can, you know, if you can get this good made in China by someone working at one twentieth of the price, well, doesn't that mean I either lose my job or I have my wages cut a massive amount? Well, all right, let me. Let me give reasons why that shouldn't be a persuasive argument. First, the reason that American workers are paid so much more than workers in poorer countries is because American workers are on average much more productive. Part of it's the skill level of American workers, but it's also the infrastructure. You know, the, it's, it's the road system. It's having not as corrupt police. It's having, you know, electrical grid systems. It's, it's everything else. So maybe American workers are paid 20 times as much as a counterpart in a poor country, but they might be more than 20 times as productive. Another argument, though, is to say, well, maybe you're right, maybe trade with China would cause an American factory worker, or some American factory workers to lose their jobs. But why is that happening? That's because American consumers are finding it more in their self-interest to buy the good from China or the other poor country than it is to buy the good made in the United States. So even though this one worker loses his job, a lot of consumers are better off and we shouldn't you know, discount the fact that you know, the consumers are hurt. I mean, the point of making stuff is that so we can enjoy it. So if you can get stuff made cheaper in other countries, you know, that's, that's great. Also think what happens to the save money. So imagine that Americans, because of trade with China, we're buying goods more cheaply from China. Well, that means we've got extra money. And what are we doing with that extra money? Maybe we're saving it. Well, good, we're saving it and then you know, it goes to the stock market and goes to build new factories. Or maybe we're spending it in restaurants or we're spending it in other places. So the money will get recirculated and more Americans will, will get the benefit of that money. All right, let's go to the next objection trade harms workers in poor countries. So this argument is, is you could say, well, oh my gosh, you know, you got a, a poor peasant farmer in Bangladesh, you've trade, how is that farmer possibly gonna compete with that rich American farmer? I mean, the American farmer has you know, this really expensive um, fertilizer and, and tractor and satellite navigation of the tractor and all these things. I mean, it, it's just the farmer is gonna, in Bangladesh is gonna be devastated. Don't we need to protect the farmer? Well, um, I would say no. I would say that trade is, is really what is in the long run going to allow poor people in poor countries to get richer. Think of American companies, you know, having, having these formulas for wealth. You know, we, we have all this knowledge that poor countries lack for how to turn people and raw materials into wealth. And in some ways, we're, we're sharing that with poor countries when we trade with them. And ideally, they would actually learn from that. Also, of course, the worker in the poor country can compete with the worker in the richer country by accepting a lower wage. And that might seem heartless. Oh, but you're having this poor worker in a poor country accept a lower wage to sell stuff to America. Well, yeah, but that might be better than not trading with America where they'd get an even lower wage selling stuff in their domestic market. 
So the next two objections to trade, they can be misused, but they are kind of reasonable. When you trade with someone, you become richer and the other side becomes richer. But what if you want the other country to be poorer? So let's say the United States is thinking about ending its trading relationships with, well, I'll call it evil nation. And, you know, evil nation uses, you know, half of their wealth to torture people and to bomb random cities and to build a military that we're hoping one day to use to destroy the United States. Well, you can imagine it be very rational for the United States to say, hmm, if we don't trade with evil nation, we'll be poorer, but so will they. Yeah, that's worth it to us. Because maybe we're overall so much richer if we each lose $5 billion, we're willing to do that. We're willing to be $5 billion poorer if we can make evil nation poorer. So that that can be a valid objection to trade. Because, you know, if you don't want the other side, if you want the other side to get poorer, then you shouldn't want to trade with them. Now, the danger here is, you know, let's say my, I, I make refrigerators, I'm an American refrigerator manufacturer, and I'm losing business because people from this other country are selling refrigerators to America and they're making better refrigerators than I can. I'm going to go to my politician. Oh, we shouldn't let this other country sell refrigerators in America because, um, oh yeah, they're evil. Look what they've done to the monarch butterfly or they mistreat their deer or they've done this bad. You know, every country does something bad. So I figure out what bad things they've done and I say, oh, we can't trade with them. They're the, they are the evil nation. We must make them poor. So, you know, American companies who are in, in competition with, you know, um, with companies in other countries have an incentive to label what the other countries are as evil when they're really not. Now, and here's another objection to trade in that um, it's good to retaliate against countries that won't let you trade with them in certain goods. So let's take um, automobile manufacturers in Japan. Let's imagine that the Japanese auto manufacturers are politically very powerful and they do not allow American cars to be sold in Japan. I actually don't know if this is true or not, but it's, it's not relevant. Let's just pretend it's true. So the Japanese auto manufacturers do not allow American cars to be sold in their country. This is clearly bad for Japan, but you know the Japan, it's good for the Japanese auto, auto manufacturers, bad for Japanese consumers, but it's good for the auto manufacturers, and let's say the auto manufacturers are bribing the Japanese government. So United States car companies don't like this. Like, wait a minute, the Japanese can sell cars, their cars in our country, but we can't sell our cars in their country. That's not right. So you can imagine what the United States could do is say to Japan, you know, say to the Japanese auto industry, okay, well, here's the deal. We're not going to let you sell cars in our country unless you let us sell cars in your country. So that the Jap, you know, that's a way of the Japanese auto manufacturers now might be better off accepting the deal. So you can re basically threaten to limit trade in over in order to overall expand trade. But again, the problem with this is that people will say we need to retaliate when there really isn't anything to retaliate for. So if I'll go back to my refrigerator making thing, let's say you know I, I've been selling refrigerators in Brazil. But I, I haven't done very well, and maybe it's my, my product quality is going down. I'm just I used to sell a lot of refrigerators in Brazil, but now I'm not. So I go to my congressman and I say, um, you know, Brazil, there. Oh yeah, I'm not selling refrigerators in Brazil anymore. Oh yeah, it's not because my refrigerators are become crappy, but because they're not letting me. They're they're cheating. They're not letting me sell refrigerators there. So I think you should ban the sale of their refrigerators in our country. And of course, I like this because then I don't have to compete with their refrigerators. So, you know, companies will have an incentive to lie about when retaliation is necessary. The final objection to trade is what's called the Santa Claus problem. Now, what I'm going to tell you today about Santa Claus, it's the truth and it's shocking. Santa Claus has this fantastic propaganda going for him. You know, everyone thinks he's this nice, jolly man. Don't believe it. Santa Claus is pure evil. Santa Claus is a slave master, right? He's got elves making toys for him. He doesn't pay the elves. They're brainwashed. They, they have to work for him. Then Santa Claus has enslaved reindeers that totally bypass shipping companies and you know, drop presents that the elves were forced to make on, you know, the, on a large part of the world. Think about what Santa Claus is doing to poor toy manufacturers. You've got a toy company, you know, it has to pay its workers, workers who have families who depend on their wages. How are they supposed to compete with Santa Claus and his slave, elf, and reindeer army? 
They can't. The only thing worse than Santa Claus is the sun. Half of the time, the sun showers the earth with free light. What are, what are candle manufacturers and light bulb manufacturers supposed to do? I mean, how, how are they, you know, this is giant ball throwing out free product. They're just, the profits of light bulb and candy many, candle manufacturers are vastly lower because of the sun. And this, this gets at the problem of dumping. When another country can produce something really cheaply and they sell it to us and they drive out domestic manufacturers, that's, that's every bit as evil and every bit as bad for our economy as what Santa Claus and the sun do to us. Thanks for listening.